Welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference Plenary Session, Latino Stories, New Narratives in American Media. This session is made possible thanks to the support of our sponsors, AMC Networks, STARS, and Amazon. Representative Joaquin Castro is today's panel host. He represents Texas's 20th District. He serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence as well as the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Education and Labor Committee. Representative Castro currently serves as chair of the Texas Democratic Caucus. Our moderator for today's session is Cristina Guerrero, the host of the nationally syndicated lifestyle show, The List. She's an Emmy nominee, a published writer, an actor, and a producer. Please welcome Representative Joaquin Castro. Hi, y'all. I'm Joaquin Castro, and I represent my hometown of San Antonio, Texas, in the U.S. House of Representatives. Welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference. I'm proud to present this next panel, Latino Stories, New Narratives in American Media. I view the lack of Latino representation in media and film as a fundamental issue for our community. Latinos are nearly 20% of the U.S. population, but we're mostly invisible from the image-defining and narrative-creating institutions of American society. From newsrooms and publishing floors to media and Hollywood, Latinos are hardly reflected in full and often portrayed as negative stereotypes. This systemic exclusion has created a void in narrative. And in that void, politicians like Donald Trump have used negative stereotypes to demonize and target the Latino community. And in its extreme, you get what happened in El Paso, where a madman drives over 10 hours to kill 23 people because he considers them, quote, Hispanic invaders to Texas. The systemic exclusion of Latinos in American society is dangerous, and it's dangerous for all Americans as well. As the former chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, I made this issue a top priority during my term, and I'm still working hard on it today. But one meeting really stood out to me during that time. I convened a meeting with the Association of American Publishers, the largest producers of books and textbooks in America. And I asked one of the CEOs of a top textbook publisher, a highly educated, very accomplished man, whether he could name three Latinos or Latinas who had made a significant contribution in American history. He earnestly thought about it for a moment, and then he finally said, no, I can't. And he wasn't being rude, and he wasn't being dismissive of my question. This man simply could not think of three Latinos or Latinas who had made a significant impact in American history. And I'm convinced that if you ask that question to most Americans, they would probably give you the same answer. Our mission is to break through these barriers of exclusion and empower Latinos and Latinas to tell our stories. And this panel is a wonderful opportunity to advance this conversation and ultimately to rally our community. Thank you for all of your hard work and please reach out, reach out to me if I can ever be helpful. Enjoy the conversation. Wow, I just have to say um, thank you so much to Congressman Joaquin Castro for his opening remarks. Um, he's setting a great tone for our conversation today. And thank you also to CHCI for hosting this leadership conference and deciding to focus attention on amplifying Latino voices in American media. And thank you guys for joining Latino Stories, a new New Narratives in American Media. I am your moderator today. My name is Cristina Guerrero, or like my mom likes to call me, Cristina Guerrero. And I'm the host of the nationally syndicated lifestyle show, uh, The List. After listening to uh, Joaquin Castro, um, and hopefully after today's discussion, I hope that you will feel hopeful and optimistic for the future of the representation of our community. But the fact remains, as he said, that Latinos account for nearly 20% of America's population, but less than 6% of the characters on broadcast, cable, and streaming platforms. So here's my question. What's the holdup, right? Where's the disconnect? Where are our faces? Where are our stories? As we continue to take steps for a more representative future in media, there are people fighting the good fight and they are joining us today. And I'm so excited to talk to them. Uh, let's start with Dr. Ana Cristina Ramon. 
She is the Director of Research and Civic Engagement in the Division of Social Sciences at UCLA. Dr. Ramon is also the co-author of the annual UCLA Hollywood Diversity Report Series. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. Next up, we have a very beautiful, extremely talented and creative actress. Denai Garcia is a Cuban-American actress. She is currently starring as Luciana in AMC's hit show, Fear the Walking Dead. She is also a writer, producer, and host of the Denai Garcia podcast. Denai, thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, Manny Miravete, Director of Spanish Language Original Content at Audible. Manny works with producers, creators, editors, performers, screenwriters, authors, and large production companies to develop engaging content for Audible's Spanish language customers. Manny has launched over 50 original Spanish and English language productions, ranging from audiobooks to podcasts and original multicast productions. Um, okay, so we are about to get started, but we want to let everybody out there know that if you have any questions for our panelists, we'll have a brief Q&A at the end. So make sure you type in your questions into the box on the right side of your screen. I hope I... Okay. Okay. Um, hey guys, thank you guys again so much um, for joining. This is going to be such an exciting conversation. You know, I studied... Um, uh, Ana Cristina, I, I hope you don't hold this against me, but I studied um, race uh, in uh, college at USC many years ago when I was studying broadcast journalism. And this is a conversation that we have been having for a very long time. Um, so I'm very eager to talk to you and start with you about where we are. This was 20 years ago when I was studying this. Are the number, have we seen a, a progression? Have we seen growth? What is your research showing us? Well, at UCLA, we've been um, you know, publishing these annual research reports on Hollywood racial, ethnic, and gender diversity since 2014. But our data goes all the way back to 2011, and we we examine film and television, and we look at in front of and behind the camera. And when you look at the numbers for for Latinos for the Latinx community, it's pretty stagnant. So it's really disheartening that over the years since 2011, the numbers have not exceeded 6% in front of the camera. And behind the camera, the numbers are pretty dismal in terms of directors and writers. So it's it's usually around 3%. And, and when, we, when we talk about film, we're talking about the top 200 films at the global box office. That's the ones that we examine. And then when we do the analysis, we eliminate um, the non-English language films. So we're looking at who Hollywood is actually employing. And um, for the most part, it's just, they're not employing enough Latinx directors, Latinx screenwriters, and then for, for television, it's also, we're looking at the entire TV season. We're looking at broadcast, cable, and digital platforms. And there you also see that there is just a very low number, low percentage that's disproportionate to our population numbers. And so um, there's definitely a lot more work that needs to be done Overall, when, when you look at the trend in terms of overall racial ethnic diversity um, in front of the camera, it's actually improved overall when you combine um, all di different pe people of color, the, the different communities. But for, for Latinos, unfortunately, it's still um, really lagging behind our, our population numbers. Now, I know you deal mainly with research, but um, uh, so opinions in research always <laughs> don't uh, don't matter. But what seems to be the holdup, as I as I kind of mentioned at the top of of this? So what we we've also done is we've examined the executives. Right. And so we've looked at the top executives, the decision makers. And although there are Latinx executives out there, and a lot of oftentimes you'll find them at production companies, but when you when you look at the studio heads, 
when you look at the heads of the, the major units across the studios, the Latinx representation is really abysmal. It's like it's like two percent or something. It's and 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 that's when you look at the unit heads. And so the the top tier, there's like hardly there's no a Latinx representation. So the only probably um, Latinx representation that we have in the like who has the highest position is Victoria Alonso. And so she was just, you know, um, promoted to president um, at Marvel and not president of Marvel, but like uh, she has a president title now. But besides her, it's there aren't enough Latinx decision makers that have that green lighting power. Right. So so that's where we need you know, more representation um, in the executive suite in order to to be able to green light our stories and not also water them down or make them generic. Cause that's that's oftentimes from what I what we've heard people talk about when they present their stories, um, they are asked to change them or they're considered too ethnic, too specific. And to kind of fit this, with this watered down mold is what they're kind of looking for exactly, what they imagine yeah. so, what they imagine our community yeah. to be like or to look like exactly and oftentimes it depends on the platform and like how it's you know uh, the kind of reactions that they get like depending on if it's broadcast or cable or digital or film right but but the, the what the overall kind of feedback that that we've heard is that the latino storytellers Latino content creators, they're told, and you know, we can hear talk more about this in the panel, but that that they're that they're told that they that their story needs to change or that it's not gonna it's not gonna appeal to a mainstream audience. And right. we'll talk no, more about really, audience. Yeah, no, yeah, no, we definitely have that on the on the agenda too. Um, but there are some um, initiatives that are being spe spearheaded to try and rectify this lack of representation. Uh, Amazon, for instance, Audible, we are gonna be talking to Manny here. Can you describe your role within this initiative and tell us uh, how it has changed or the success of this initiative um, has been for Audible and for Amazon and for the Latino consumer? First of all, thank you for having me and and, and, and uh, really excited to be here. Um, and thank you for the question. I. I can really speak with with a lot of credibility to what Audible is doing specifically. I do work across, you know, the aisle, if you want to be relevant to the audience that's listening here, with our colleagues at Amazon, both Amazon Studios and Amazon Music. And we do source content and ideas from each other and try to make cohesive 360 approaches to how we create content. However, in the spoken word space where Audible is, is the biggest provider, we do have a couple of different initiatives, both on the content side and on the resourcing side. On uh, December 20th, we announced something called the Podcast Development Program, where we went out and uh, let potential podcast producers uh, submit their ideas to us and selected six of them to be awarded a $10,000 prize to be able to produce a pilot that then could uh, actually be a longer term series. Now, all of those winners came back and I'm not at liberty to announce them, but I will say that knowing and seeing some of these announcements that were already internal, there is a high, high degree of diversity and inclusion within that. In fact, when um, the, the sponsor, my, my colleague was announcing the, some of these winners, when she talked to the, the young Latinx, the youngest one, I think he's 19, his name is Oscar, and I can't give away his last name, but he, he was in his Zoom, and his Zoom was blanked out, like you can't see the background. As soon as she told him he had won, you couldn't have scripted this better. He turned around, and he called to somebody behind him, and it was his grandma who came up right on the screen and gave him a kiss on the forehead. And you can't write that, right? So this is such a natural way of of looking at how content can be inspired by such a, a, a beautiful moment. Um, so now we're developing these six pilots within the African-American community, the international community, LGBTQIA plus community is highly, highly represented. And we're really, really proud of that. 
there's an initiative internally at Audible called Hear My Story, and my colleague Abby West runs it, and her and I work together closely to ensure that every piece of content that we are creating um, within our programming portfolio has components of underrepresented stories in them or stories that are underrepresented of uh, underrepresented talent that fall into that. So for example, if we're creating something within sci-fi, is there a sci-fi story that has an underrepresented audience, whether it's African-American or Latinx, which is my job to bring that information in. And so I work closely with Abby on saying, look, I have some fiction, I have some documentaries, I have some true crime, and all of it happens to either be written or that starring or, or that the produced by Latinx talent. And that falls within within our initiatives to bring a lot of this content out. And what we're also doing now is producing a lot of our content specifically for the Latinx audience to be released in English and in Spanish simultaneously. Now, this might not seem like a, a huge innovation when you think about what the audiovisual does, Amazon and Netflix, because they do have the dubbing and you can hear it. But when you think about just pure audio, uh, in terms of hiring, not only are you hiring somebody in the Latinx community to write and mm. act and develop the English language portion, you're also hiring translators, producers, and programmers to have everything done in the Spanish language portion. And not just the translation, right? We're not just translating things. We are adapting it. So it might not sound like the exact same thing, but it will sound like a genuine product that was produced in that language. We have a really uh, a great uh, an initiative or a great production coming out during South by Southwest in March called Pumpkin Translation. And this is a perfect example of the kind of content that is going to elevate this, uh, th these types of initiatives, right? This is about the Latinx influence in the genre of punk music. When you think about punk, you think about white dudes with mohawks. But with this uh, production, this podcast, both being released in English and in Spanish, is going to do is prove that a lot of this influence, like the cha-cha-cha influence, Louis Louis, who is now a punk anthem. So when you, when you actually hear it, you have a lot of aha moments where you're like, oh, wow, I had no idea that that happened. Or like the first band that was called a punk band were a bunch of Mexican kids from Detroit. And they were called that in Cream Magazine back in the 1960s. And they wrote a song that everybody would recognize called 96 Tears. So anyway, super excited about those kinds of things. And we have a lineup of that kind of content coming up. So we're really forward facing in that regard. And that's something that comes from the top. And also yeah. like we have some of the Latinx talent that like myself that is contributing to that. But that's coming from our head of content to the, our vice president of Audible Studios, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think that's the, the key is also bringing in the talent to be able to execute these initiatives that speak to the community. So um, we have a lot more to discuss with you, but I want to move on to Deny because we're super excited to have you um, as well. We talk a lot about what's going on behind the scenes, but of course, in front of the camera is is extremely crucial. We become I say we, like you're a movie star, TV actress, I'm a TV host, but in front of the camera, we um, have a responsibility, right? Uh, we have a responsibility to um, be reflective of what our community looks like in all different different shapes and forms. And so I've always felt very um, passionate about that. Um, tell me about your experience um, representing the, the Latin American community. First of all, thank you for having me. Uh, now more than ever, you know, being part of these kind of conversations, I can just not share my experience, but I can learn so much. I mean, this like five minutes, whatever, it's been like for me five, but it's been like 20 minutes. I don't know how long it's been, but it's just, we, you know, being part of conversations like this, you learn so much and you understand your responsibilities and how you can use your, you know, resources to change things, right? So thank you so much for having me, Anna Christina. Beautiful stuff you just said in two seconds. I just, I'm just blown away. I'm Manny too. Uh, what an honor! Uh, you know, being in front of the camera, in front of the screen, it's 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 just also opening a world to our community to see themselves in in this case, fear the Walking Dead in an apocalypse. Right? I represent the Latino our Latino community, I want uh, girls to see themselves as badass women because that's who they are, you know, dealing with like difficult circumstances. It's like, we can do it. It's, you know, seeing each other reflected in stories that no, you, we usually are not there, you know, it's so important. And, and the reason why it's so important is because we're naturally you know, we learn through stories. Like every time, you know, since the moment you're born, mom read you stories. Like we learn so much from storytelling and that never dies. <laughs> you keep learning and growing as you, you know, 
grow older and 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 it's just it never ends it, it that's how that's a way to educate ourselves and to inspire each other uh on on a you know high scale so uh being able to first of all being part of the show for so many years representing the latino community uh for me has been huge uh another latino that we have in our show is ruben blades ruben blades which is an another you know, salsa singer, you can, he's influenced the entire world, kind of like putting us in such a good uh, place. And, you know, it, it's such a, it's a, I, it's a job that I take very seriously because I want to make sure that everyone feels, you know, first of all, see Latinos in this universe and Latinos seeing re themselves reflected in this universe. It's, it's massively important. Uh, it changes the way, you know, it's, it's an inclusion thing. It's like, it's how we, and you know what's beautiful too, Christina, is that, you know, the ways an American would react to the apocalypse is completely different from a Latino that re re would react to the apocalypse. We're living the same universe, like we're like in the same apocalypse, but it's it's like, it's it just gives so much colors. It just gives different perspective. We get to mm -hmm. know each other in a deeper level through like chaos and craziness, right? Um, I never so thought I, of I never thought of the fact of how I might re respond to an apocalypse as a Latina versus somebody else. You're right; it would be different. <laughs> you know what? You know what's crazy? My character on the show, she's from Mexico, and in the Mexican culture, Mexican culture has beautiful relationship with the dead. So you know, imagine like oh. there's an apocalypse in Mexico. You know, they celebrate the Dia de los Muertos. So. You know, they would be like, oh, my gosh, like it's like a, they would use it like, to protect themselves as like we did on the show. But, you know, if you put like a walking dead in a culture that is not used to go into a cemetery to celebrate, like in Coco, for example, the movie Coco, it's like it's, it's a different approach to the, the entire thing. And, and I love and, that and perspective. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing about having inclusion and being diverse. And, and that's my take on it like I want to learn I'm from Cuba and I decided to study the Mexican culture because I want to be able to include that into this world and, and and it's just been a non-stop experience it's been so amazing well I love that and that's actually a perfect segue into our next question because uh, I'm Mexican-American you talk about being um from from Cuba um a lot of times in Hollywood, as Latinos, we are lumped into just one big, huge group. And I think there's this misconception that that we are all the same. And I think a lot of our own experiences, right, can get lost. So, Anna Christina, what would you say is, um, what is, what is our outlook like in Hollywood when it comes to the diversity within our own culture? Yeah, so you know, just like you said, that we come from so many different countries. Um, a lot of uh, people that are Latino, that identify as Latino in the United States, the borders cross them, you know, their families have been here for generations. And so there is this diversity within our community that doesn't get, usually get translated on screen because of the fact that Hollywood has such a narrow view of us and that's a huge issue, right? And so, you know, in addition to us coming from different countries and different backgrounds, we also can be from any race, right? Because we are an ethnic group. And so it's really like the culture that ties us together, that there are these, there are these common experiences that a lot of us have. Um, but there's definitely, you know, the importance of, representing that diversity within our community through our stories and un unfortunately that's where the issue is that we're not we're not having that opportunity to have our stories told and what happens is that when you have a stereotypical um, portrayal of one group the repetition leads to acceptance and the m the majority of you know, the people that are not Latino, that don't interact with Latinos on a daily basis, what they see on screen is what they think is true. And and mm -hmm. and then that's that obviously affects public policy, that affects, you know, just a lot of things that that will affect our the Latino community very deeply, right? And so so then those are huge problems in Hollywood right now because of the numbers that I, you know, talked about earlier. 
then when you look at the audience and the power of our audience and like our buying power and you probably heard that a lot like you know i think recently people have been talking a lot more about the latino buying power and how it's you know in the trillions right and so for latinos we are avid entertainment consumers right so that's something that people need to really understand that we are um, often early adopters of technology. We, we like to go to the movie theaters. We buy the most tickets per person out of any of the other groups. So we really are boosting the entertainment industry, right? And so that's why I always say like, we are investors of this industry. And, and as investors, we need to demand that our stories are told as well, right? So no investor would just be like, oh, okay, you could do whatever you want. I mean, I guess unless, you know, they were they were so rich that they just wanted to walk away, but we are active investors in, <laughs> in this industry. And because we are avid entertainment consumers, we want to see the, we want to see the best. We want to see what other people are talking about. We are, we are truly in, you know, in involved in, going to the movies, seeing the number one movie at the box office, and we know high production value. I always talk about that, that Latinos are such good, you know, entertainment consumers that they know what a Game of Thrones budget looks like versus one where they they know that you're pandering to them because it's like zero budget, right? And so, so they want to see something that has an investment from Hollywood because then they know that that's something that has has you know high production value and will be entertaining to them, right? So, also, so that's something that people understand need to understand. Yeah, no, I also feel like, um, and this I feel like this happens a lot is you know we are a consumer of American uh, of American entertainment. We're not asking that every story needs to tell my exact unique story, but I just want to see my face up there. I want to see my, my experience up there. I want to see the people that I, you know, I, that's the part that's always been, that's always been confusing for me because I'm like, yes, like Latinos as a whole, we are a people, um, but a Puerto Rican versus a Cuban versus a Dominican or Mexican American. We, there are facets of our community that can, we can see and that we can explore without having to be, this is a Mexican story. This is a Puerto Rican story because then that's <laughs> exactly. when it really starts to get div divisive. Right. Um, yeah. uh, and actually that, that brings me to great critically acclaimed uh, productions. Manny, this one's for you. Uh, a lot of times these shows that do have uh, Latino stories, great Latino stories, um, but they don't get the recognition that they deserve. They don't get the, the mass appeal that they deserve. What's the disconnect? Well, I think you spoke to it a little bit, you know, a little bit right now when you were before you introduced this. And these are the types of things that keep me up at night. Right. I, I think about them a lot. Like, why did one day at a time get canceled twice? On different on two different networks, right? Why why did Vita only have uh, uh, three and three and a half to four seasons? You know, because they kind of split the last one up. These are quality, well told stories, and I, I think I start going back to something that you mentioned in the way I approach how I source content specifically. I want to hear a good American story. What does that mean? American stories are made up of immigrants all over the place and they're made up of all kinds of different experiences. So I wanna hear a story of love or I wanna hear a story of tragedy, of passion that happens to be written by somebody that's in the Latinx community. So I'll source that and read that a lot more or happens to be starring somebody that's in the Latinx community or happens to be sourced from somebody's grandfather who's in the Latinx community. Whatever the case may be, I'm starting to take the lens of or the ear in this case, of listening to these types of pitches for these types of content and thinking about how does this relate overall? How is somebody in Oklahoma, why are they gonna wanna hear a story about a Dominican family in New York? Because it's a story about family and those things are quintessential. So you may hear something about the Dominican culture that you weren't aware of, but the way we try to write this content is that in the context of it, also because it's audio, you are able to explain. You can speak in Spanish, but then say something else that brings you context to whether it's an insult or whether it's uh, a slang or whether it's something that's related to uh, Santos or something like that, which is intrinsic to our 
uh, Latinx cultural identity, but someone might not necessarily know about. However, they're getting pulled in by the story of the family, by the story of the things that, um, that they are trying to overcome personally, whether they be immigrants or not. So that's, so that's a way that we're doing it as well. And then also looking at how can we take just international content, which is done a lot, specifically from Latin America, and stop just doing just pure translation of it, right? How do we actually adapt it to make sure that it appeals to the audience and the nuances? We're not a homogenized audience. We come from all kinds of different places. We have all kinds of different values as well. Elections have proven that, have we seen it? So what is that thread that goes through? It's the things that connects us also as, as Americans. When you say the other disconnect is the way the way these some these shows are sometimes marketed, they're they're marketed yeah. in such a way that it's like the Latino. I, mean, I don't show want to criticize anybody else is, is marketing, but here's what happens, right? You you the, the census comes they're, out. They're and everybody's like, oh my god, Hispanics, Latinx, and they're growing so much. I want to hear these stories. So then the pitches are looked at it through that lens of here's another Latinx story, and this is why I gotta get it because the census is growing. And then that influences the marketing of the shows that say, okay, well, I'm only going to market this to the Latinx audience. You should not be just marketing it to the Latinx audience. You should market it to everybody because it's a good story. And I think that that's what happened to a show. Like one day at a time was, was rescued twice, but I, I, you know, I, I, I love Netflix, but I don't know if they did enough to say, here's just a good family story versus just trying to get into like, how do we get the Latino audience? And another thing, this is our responsibility. We have to show up for our own content, right? That's another thing hey, that, that, that I, I, like, I don't. I don't care from from one thing to the next. I'm like, good, bad. I, if you're brown on TV, I'm watching you. <laughs> I'm kind of yeah. sure. So it's all about uh, it's well, all about the all our people that are listening. Show up. Yes. Yeah. Show it's all up. about the framing. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted want want to add something to that. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, that, please do. I was going to come to you next. So please, if you have something to follow up with, I would love to hear it. I wanted to add something to that because when I work a character, I don't think of Latinos. <laughs> like when I'm talking about, oh, this character is falling in love. I'm not talking about a love that only Latinos understand. I'm, I, it's a love that we all understand. It's a love that we all connect to. It's the same basic needs. Of, so it's it's a... You know, when even when you break down a role, you don't you don't just don't think of one group of people because we are not that's not storytelling. So it, I completely agree. It's a it's a it should not we should not always see things to one uh, box because it's that's really what put us in the box, you know. And, right. Um, well, and that, that was actually that, a question. That. Yeah, no, that was actually um, very similar to the question that I had for you. But um, you're representing all, you know, not just a Latina, but you're also representing a strong female character. So all of these things kind of go into every character that you that you represent on camera. So how do you how do you find um, wh where do you find your balance to make sure that you're hitting all of these things that you want to make sure that you're representing? I, you know, I grew up uh, watching telenovelas. You know, you, you you just sit down next to grandma and you just watch it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, happens to be telenovelas. And and I noticed that, uh, you know, the moment I, 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 I remember seeing, you know, the typical Latina, like, oh, she's saved by this person. And because of this person, she has a shot in life. And, 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 you know, and, and, and that is something that I feel like telenovelas had kind of stopped a little bit because it put us in a, in a box, you know, since the moment we're little, we're like, oh, this is how it is. Right. So as an actor, I realized that I want to stop that. I, because that's not our reality. You know, Latinas at home, my mom, my grandma, they're not waiting to be saved. They are like taking care of kids, you know, going everywhere, just, you know, dealing with a bunch of things at once and, you know, dealing with budgets. Like, you never see, like, it was something off from, like, what you will see in the TV versus the reality. Like, I don't, my, all the females in my life, they've never been, like, saved by this person and taking, you know. <laughs> so I felt like I wanted to tell, you know, going back to this, this, this stories that are real, you know. And, and and this is funny because people say you always play badass women. I'm like, because we're all badasses. Like, there's not such yeah. a thing as, like, sweet person. Like, Maybe in a telenovela, they, they have these arcs that don't work, but it, there's an 
audience for that is entertaining. But the reality is that when you look around, we are full of women that, you know, they're quite inspiring. And those are the stories that I'm interested in doing. It's just the closest to reality, you know, we mean women, Latino women, we, we deal with so much, you know, whether you are born and raised here or whether you bring your children here, there's a lot to take on. And I feel like we are all badasses. So, I, so for me, it's like, I'm just telling your story or your aunt's story or your grandma. Or like, I'm just, you can see yourself in there. And, and that's what I'm passionate about. And I always try to look for that, how to be vulnerable, strong, and, and feel, and not be afraid to feel pain and not be afraid to, you know, stand up for yourself. It's like all these layers that create who we are as women. I love that. Speaking of badass women, I'm going to go back to Ana Cristina. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice I mean, segue, right? Talking, I'm like, she's just such a badass, right? Like right away. <laughs> <laughs> we only have just a few, um, uh, about 30 seconds before we head to the Q&A. We have some great, great Q&As. But I wanted to go back to this idea of the the, the people who do the green lights. How do we get more Latinos, more people of color into those very coveted roles. A lot of times, you know, I know that companies want us to um, believe that they are, you know, diversity initiatives, but they ain't going anywhere, right? So how do we get these people into these roles? Well, the thing is, um, there's strategic change that needs to take place, right? So um, for studios and networks that, you know, have all of this power in Hollywood, it, the, the change has to come from the top and the message has to be from top to bottom that this is what the company will be doing. And, and part of that is bringing up the executives that are there, because like I said, there are Latinx executives, but they're just not in those positions of power. And so like we have this study, this we, qualitative study that we did a couple of years ago that really looks at what are the most effective um things that you need to do. And, and, and one of them is sponsoring women of color, because when we, when you look at any kind of change from the, the executive numbers, we looked at it five years, um, six years ago, and then we looked at it last year. So it was like a five year difference. And what we saw is that if there was any change, there was a change in gender, right? And then when you look um, closely, you found out that white women really benefited the most from this push for diversity. And so then there's still then that issue of that, that, that there's this issue there where the cultural um, connection to these stories is still missing, right? So, so that's where you need to see that the companies make a commitment, be transparent, be public about their um, uh, you know, push to to really change their studio at, at, at a, in a structural way, and that and by doing that, they have to promise to kind of bring up, you know, these Latinx executives, sponsor them, move them up the ladder. Got it. Thank you so much for that. You guys, we have some great Q and A's from our audience. Um, there, uh, let's see here, some great ones. Let me start. Um, how do we pressure Hollywood to increase the numbers of stories they tell about Latinos. Um, do you think putting pressure, I mean, we talked a little bit about this. There's a couple of questions. There's a couple of questions about this, but putting pressure in terms of uh, buying tickets, showing up, what would you say, Manny? Well, obviously those are some of the, our ingrained um, methods going all the way back to Cesar Chavez and the boycotts, right? That could have a huge, huge impact. But I don't think that that's going to necessarily add the type of pressure as much of as it would be consuming more of the content, whether it's through um, through streaming platforms or actually buying and backing it up with numbers, right? So I, for me, if it how can you actually quote unquote pressure Hollywood? You have to do it from the inside. And so what I'm seeing, at least in my organization, both at Amazon and at Audible, is that there is a concerted, concerted effort to bring in executives of color in the Latinx community to make those types of decisions. I know because I work closely with them. Now, are they getting to those higher levels? 
it is a gradual process, but it is happening. And as you see it, we are starting to source a lot more content that's coming from, from the community. But once again, it's really about like, is, what is the story, right? We're not just going to be telling stories about soccer. That would be like somebody in Canada just telling stories about hockey. It's no, no nothing that falls within those stereotypes, just telling the stories that actually connect with people. And I think once you we started to see that more, and you're going to see that more later on, the pressure will come because the audiences will push for it. And they'll say, this is the kind of content I like. And we have all kinds of algorithms and data that back that up now. So you can actually take and say, here is what the, the data of what my audience is showing and how they're consuming it. How can you not make a sequel to this? How can you not make a follow-up or ancillary story to something like that? I need a Coco too. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I just chime in on the on the bottom yes, line part? I actually didn't have a chance to really talk about that, but you know, in our research, what we've shown from the start, and then when we started to look at the audience more closely, we show that diversity sells. And then there's always like this this myth that like oh white people are going to be scared about diversity. Well, it's not true. They actually watch this. They will they will watch something that is reflective of the reality that they experience as well. They are also interested in seeing diverse casts, you know, and diverse stories, right? So so and the one main thing is that like like I I was talking about earlier though too is that people of color are really supporting the industry, right? And so these increasingly diverse audiences are wanting more and more diversity on screen. And, and what we've seen in every year in our report is that that is a strong, there's a stronger connection to that. I love that. Denai, uh, we have a question for you. Um, wanting to know how you got your foot in the door uh, in, into Hollywood. I, you know, I, I started auditioning, working really hard. I didn't hardly spoke English. I had to learn how to really, uh, you know, speak English. And then the whole thing with the accent, like, oh, you need to get rid of the accent. And, you know, I understand what's like to come and adapt and, and integrate yourself in this world. Uh, but I also understood that my contribution matters and my past matters and what I bring to the table matters because it's different, because it's unique, because it's a new perspective. And, and little by little, I just focus on my contribution. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to focus not on what I can take, but what I can give. And, and every audition was like, I'm just going to try to give you as much as I can. And eventually I'm going to like hit ex exactly what you want and, and we're going to match or we're going to, so I start like earning some sort of trust in the room because my focus was not more, my focus was not about I am more or you, or it was not a competition. It was like, I am going to contribute as much as I can from my perspective, which is different than yours and from different from the writer that wrote the story that is, that is a Latina woman, you know, and, and. And I'm just going to make it my, my, my filter. And I show you that. And trusting that. Because that's the thing. Like when you put yourself in front of people that are not from your, from your country, they don't speak your language, you know, they don't look like you, they don't know where you come from really. Like they don't know. You really have to be secure that your where you come from is quite unique and special. Authentic. And, and, it's, yeah. and it's authentic. And, and it's exactly mm -hmm. what they're looking for. They might not want it that, that specific, you know, take on it like every day. But eventually, if you really focus on contribution instead of like trying to push something, it, it's, it's a different approach that opens up doors to creativity. And, and I, I think that's of fair that. like across the... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's kind of fair across the board in anything that you that you decide right. to do. Yeah, and, and I feel like, you know, as a Latina woman, yes, and like you very well said, Christina, the, you know, there's so many layers of being a Latina. You know, we have the blonde, we have the tall, we have the curly hair, we have like, you know, the curves. We have, you know, even in our own like community, we have so many shapes and each one of us, completely different you know and uh, like for my great grandma is, is Chinese so I have some Chinese in me like it's and 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 people think like oh you're Hawaiian I'm like no I'm from Cuba they're like oh my gosh I would never so it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's like you know it's all the connection that that makes us who we are and trusting that 
uh, and understanding that you're you're so authentic and your take on this story it's unique just trusting that because you know when you don't see yourself represented on the television every day you start thinking something is wrong like i'm not uh special enough i'm not authentic enough because i'm not on tv nobody's telling my story so we start believing this pattern like anna christina said very well unless it's somebody broke the rules nobody understands that you can actually try you know it's too scary so uh so we have to start with understanding our power uh which is massive we all talked about it like some data says it a number say it like we're not coming up with those numbers uh, and understanding that you know we are here to support each other uh no matter where you come from yeah um i have one last quick um question because i think it's so interesting and so crucial especially now manny i'm going to give this last one to you um and we have 4 minutes digital and social media have changed the landscape of the future of media and entertainment. How can Latino creatives be at the forefront of those changes? Well, they have to be really active and you'd be surprised how, how many creatives I, I work with that don't have a lot of activity within uh, their social media and being savvy about it. Um, the other component I think is that there is this, the, the, the nature of trolling on the internet and social media has gotten so out of hand and it's, get, it's so discouraging to creators because it's difficult to um, put yourself, and I have this happen to me all the time, it's called imposter syndrome, right? I have submissions all the time from people and I'm like, who am I to tell you that your work isn't good enough, right? I, I, I can't, obviously. You spend so much of your time putting this together for me and my team to review to tell you whether it's something that we can do or not. So from that perspective, it can get discouraging, especially within the social and the digital space, when somebody out there who has nothing else to do but look for things to troll about is telling you that you're no good. The bottom line is continue pushing and pushing that content through. I have a lot of uh, friends who are in the social media creative space, um, and all they're doing is just cranking and cranking and cranking. And eventually I hear people asking me about them. They're like, oh, your friend is doing this. Can we have a conversation with them? Or I do it, right? I've actually produced some things for people that I've seen a lot of their content, both either on YouTube or TikTok or on Instagram stories where I'm like, that's funny. How can we make that even more long form? But if you're not present, if you're not adding me, um, I'm not going to know, right? Um, and, and I know that the Latinx and US Hispanic audiences index so high in digital penetration. So I know that they're active in and within it. Um, so it's just a matter of, there's some really great stuff of how you're relating uh, Hispanic culture to larger culture overall. Um, and, and it's some of the funniest things and some of the most entertaining things that I've seen. So please don't let the trolls bring you down and keep pushing forward. And wouldn't you say too, this is an opportunity to create. A lot of times when you work in Hollywood and uh, you know work in the entertainment industry, you're waiting for somebody to give you the yes. With social media, you get the, you give yourself the yes. You give yourself the green light to create. And then um, who knows what, what might come of that. Right. But I want to pay you. So, you know, like get it, continue <laughs> well, we pushing it out there. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I, of course, I, I, right? Like, this is great. Build your platform. And that helps so much. If you have any sort of platform where you're like, I can reach X amount of people, that helps so much in green lighting something. You have no idea how many times I've been going to different social sites and being like, okay, well, with Instagram and Facebook, they're over 500,000. Boom, let's go. You know, that mm -hmm. kind of Why do I feel like you're going to have a lot of people like adding you out the, at their, on their social media? That's my job. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. That's what I'm supposed right, to I, I get paid to do that. And I love Instagram it. Give us your Instagram handle. <laughs> well, we're here. So uh, if anybody. I think I'm at, at Manny Mirabete on Twitter. So. Okay. All right. Twitter. Hey. Um, all right. Well, we have just another minute or so. Um, uh, during COVID, we increased our media consumption. Is this screen time good for our mental health? How do you cultivate healthy relationships with the audience? Oh, that's interesting. I'm not... I, I'm not sure who to give that one to. Anybody have any thoughts on that one? You know, I get I can take on on that one because that that's where how my podcast was born. I work, you know, so many months uh, out of a uh, year, you know, in the show Fear the Walking Dead, 
and that I haven't had the time to kind of get to know my audience, which is like, mm. uh, and during the pandemic, we shut down production for a few months and I just went straight and started doing lives. I started cooking Cuban food, like, uh, you know, a lot of my audience are from here. They know how to make tostones. And <laughs> I mean, I started just kind of like in touch with them. And then I said, okay, you know, it's time for me to go back to work. How can we keep this connection? And I, that's how my, my podcast was born. So it's an opportunity for us to get to understand who is interested in, you know, in what I do in, in the stories that I create and how can I make it better? And what I've noticed is that everybody loves the fact that I'm Cuban. Everybody wanted to learn how to make Cuban food. And I love to cook. So, I mean, if you, so I created this YouTube thing, Cooking with La Familia is called. And, you know, it's like open so much of like, and it's all the celebration of who we are. And, and, right. And, and it's cultivation of relationships. I think a lot of people were missing during COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. You guys, we're almost done. They're all, they're telling me it's almost over. Can you believe that? So we're going to um, do some brief final thoughts. Um, I I mean, this was such a great, great conversation. So I, I'm happy to throw out a question or if you have something else that you would like to add. Um, you know, I started this, this um, session, actually, Joaquin Castro, uh, Congressman Joaquin Castro started this um, a little... Uh, I wanted it to be optimistic, right? We know what the numbers are. Anna Christina, we know what the research is showing us. Um, but do we have time? Do we have the room to be optimistic for what representation holds within our narratives and the stories that we're telling? Manny, I can start with you. Absolutely. And I can say just with confidence that the talent out there in terms of writing and producing at all levels, at all ages, is inspiring. Some of the pitches I get, I'm just like, where did you come up with this kind of idea? You know, it was, it's just really funny log lines. I know for a fact that aside from the production that I talked about earlier, I have five more that are going to be uh, published both in English and in Spanish with well-known talent. One of them by 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 Skybound, which is the you know initially produced the the, the Walking Dead. So. So we're working with some really well-known production companies and production houses and digging out for some of the best talent out there and some of the stuff that I'm seeing both from a voice acting perspective and from a writing, more importantly, writing perspective um, is really inspirational, not just in the fiction and entertainment space, but in the self-development and self-help space where there's a lot of people consume a lot of that audio content. So really looking to educate themselves, et cetera. So I'm very, very optimistic. And I have to be, you know, I don't, I'm not just saying it because it's my job, but I feel really, really great about it. And I really happen to love what I do as well. So I love that. Deny. Um, I absolutely, we're barely starting our, <laughs> our journey. Uh, I think that this is the first time, you know, and this is a conversation that proves that, you know, conversations like this, educating ourselves about, you know, the goals that we have to, uh, you know, achieve and taking that responsibility very seriously. And yes, there is, you know, I feel like we are, I feel like if you put, you know, you put a Latino, you put like, you know, everybody from all over the world, the Latino would just come up, will happen to just crack a joke. Like we are like that kind of a, uh, you know, like culture, which is like, so uh, that will fit anywhere, even in the apocalypse, trust me, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> We just need that person that just like breaks it all and just make things lighter. And 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 yes, there's space for that, especially now more than ever. We need that inclusion. And and that's why we're here. We're here to but it starts with educating ourselves to to understand how important that is and not just assume that this is how it is. It's 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 understanding that it matters and that like Manny said, we're not just being part of a story to to entertain the Latino community. We are entertaining the entire world. It's like we yeah. are part of it. So, yeah, absolutely. I love that. Anna Christina, you, you're the numbers person. Do we have yeah. reason to be up? <laughs> I think so. I, I think that the there are a lot of things that still need to happen, right, for us to kind of just um, get into that, stage where our numbers will just keep on going up and up but I feel like that our community is re-energized 
And, you know, again, going back to the audience, um, it's like the understanding that the modern Latino is ambicultural. And that's the term that like a lot of other research companies are using now, right? And so it's the idea that we're 100% into the mainstream and 100% into our own culture. And so mm. when you say that, you know, we can be watching a Spanish language telenovela with our abuelita on the same day that we watch Fear of the Walking Dead, right? And so, you know, we're, we're watching both. We're not, we're not like struggling with it. We're going in and out of it. And it's, it's fluid for us. It's, it's all the, you know, at the same time, but that just shows that again, that we are avid consumers. And so that's why I feel like we are, you know, the drivers of our destiny. Right. And so, so that there, there's this really kind of critical point right now uh, as the pandemic, as we're getting out of the pandemic to keep pushing forward for that. And I have really, you know, high hopes that our community will, will do that. And so I'm, 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 I'm excited to see the future. Well, well said. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up now, but I want to thank all of you guys for this discussion. It was insightful and thoughtful and um, optimistic, dare I say. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Fair thank way. you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. You guys, I just wanted to uh, thank you again, but also there is some house cleaning that I wanted to, to bring up to you guys. Um, uh, we want you to keep tweeting about the conference. Okay, I'm going to give you the hashtag. You might have to write it down. C-H-C-I-H-H-M-2-1. We have a full slate of sessions scheduled for the next three days. So we encourage you to log back in tomorrow at 11 a.m. for our Environmental Justice Town Hall and attend sessions throughout the day for that. Um, also, you guys, how much fun did we have? So if you want to call up your friends and tell them they should sign up for the conference, it's not too late. They can um, do that at chci.org. All you have to do is log in and register. Super easy and it's free. Um, and then, of course, join our virtual 44th annual awards gala, 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 celebration on Thursday evening, September 23rd from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and just, you know, once you're registered for the conference, you'll also be registered for the gala. So you should dress up for that, even if you're at home. Um, but that's it. So thank you guys so much. Um, I just have to wanted to say a couple of things as we strive um, for more representation in the media. We have to recognize that the work we're doing will shape the perception of who we are, not just for our future Latino generations, but for all Americans and, of course, for all of the world. So the time for action is now. The time for change is now, and all we need to do is work together boldly and aggressively now. Thank you guys so much for joining.